name is Sharona, and I'm happy everyone is here. And I would just like want to let you know that I'm a little fraction of a big project of three Zooms a day for children, one for adults in Hebrew, one for adults in English um, for the whole month of November. So we are hoping that you will be joining us other days as well. And as you can see here, we're talking about nature, Bible, and culture. And since it note Kedumim, we cater both uh, Jewish and Christian audiences. When we say Bible, it is not only the Hebrew Bible, it is not only the Tanakh, it is also the New Testament. As opposed to the Tanakh, where there are more than a hundred names of plants, um, there are just about a dozen in the New Testament, most of which are from the Old Testament as well. Of course, the seven species, the grape, the fig, uh, they, they are mentioned um, in the New Testament. We have to uh, understand, of course, that Jesus, as a Jew, uh, being active in the land of the Jew, being very knowledgeable of the Hebrew Bible, uh, quoting from the Hebrew Bible, quoting from Isaiah, quoting from Genesis, knowing that the people who hear him know the same chapters and the same quotes, he knows the references of the flowers. He too, like the prophets before him of the first temple period of the, of the, of the Hebrew Bible period, knows the character of all the different plants. If it's a tall plant, if it's a short plant, the season that it blooms, is it thorny? It, does it have fragrance, etc. And knowing his audience that are also farmers and people living in nature, he knows that they know as well. So uh, the equivalent to the Old Testament is that every name of plant, tree, flower has a lot more meaning without needing to say, because the people live in the nature and they know it. And despite the fact that there are about a dozen plants, this presentation today will show you many more, um, which are sanctified or, or became glorified and, and became a symbol of holy events and holy people uh, to the Christian believer uh, along the years with uh, traditions that developed uh, as pilgrims came to Israel uh, more and more. So I hope I can show the whole presentation in the half hour that was given to me. If not, there's always next week and the week after. But we need to understand that for a Christian pilgrim or traveler in Israel, not only visiting the sites where miracles happen, but also seeing the landscape and see that that surrounded Jesus while he was active, seeing a flower or a plant that uh, he mentioned, seeing a flower or a plant that uh, symbolized one of the miracles or one of the parables or one of the events is also very, very exciting. It adds depth to the pilgrimage. Um, to uh, make this presentation, I um, I am not the first one who thought about it, plants of the New Testament. Uh, books go back all the way to the 19th century and plenty of new books as well. Uh, this book here by Ami Tamil that also appears in an English edition was written with the help of uh, staff of Naot Kedumim. Um, and you can see that in the acknowledgement and that is the base for my presentation. So I am a tree hugger myself. And I don't only hug trees, I love talking to trees. Uh, so you can see he, me here uh, intimately with a tree. Uh, and also Jesus himself is quoted saying that he is talking to the trees, but he sees trees as people. I see trees as people, which means when he sees a tree that is industrious and another tree that is lazy, he sees the qualities that the, the people that he talks to are also in the trees. Uh, in this specific case, um, I am with a carob tree um, that is believed to be the fruit that nourished John the Baptist while he was in the desert, while he was in the next to the Jordan River, baptizing people, wearing leather, 
um, and what he ate was crickets and um, honey of the field, and the honey is believed to be honey from uh, from carobs, and therefore in uh, English and in German and other languages, the carob is St. John's bread. That's the name of the um, tree. Um, one of the very first characters and most important characters in the New Testament is uh, Virgin Mary, the mother uh, of Jesus. And the most famous of her symbols is the white lily, the Shoshan, the Madonna lily, because it, the white color and, and the delicacy of this plant are a virtue of her virginity. Um, this plant almost came to extinction during the Crusader period in Israel because uh, Crusaders who adored Virgin Mary took bulbs and uh, took the plant and brought it to their villages, to their churches back in Europe. So Madonna Lily's Shoshan Sechol that you see now growing in France and Germany um, are actually descendants of what was taken by the Crusaders from Israel 800, 900 years ago to the point that today we have this flower growing naturally only or two or three spots, one above Nachal Kziv, one uh, in the Kalmel, and that's about it. A very, very famous plant that we speak about a lot in Neot Kedumim, the Marva, the sage. Um, in Hebrew, the first two letters are like Miriam, Marva Memresh, Miriam. Um, and in Arabic, it goes furthermore, Maramia. It is actually dedicated to uh, Mary. If this is the queen of the therapeutical uh, plants, I say queen and not king because in Hebrew, Malva is feminine. Um, it, it heals everything inside and out, everything from constipation to diarrhea. So it brings salvation. It brings health like uh, is attributed to Mother Mary. And the last that I will show you, and there are more, there are more plants that represent uh, Virgin Mary is the rosemary. So first of all, the name, Rose of Mary. We're not sure that that's the origin of the name. The name is Latin. It could have been from before. It could have been the dew of the sea, uh, if you know your Latin. But the blue flowers, the name and the blue flowers together combine to, and that's why believers uh, were glad to attribute it to Mary because many, many times, Mary is depicted wearing blue. Um, and if we quickly, as much as time allows us, go through the basic story that we, we're not gonna go through each pa uh, parable and not gonna go through the four um, gospels, but the basic story that we have in every chapter, there is some kind of plant that we can find as a symbol of that story. So before Jesus was born, they, um, um, there was a sign that he is going to be born. And they saw the star, the star of Bethlehem. So if you walk around Israel in the winter, around January, February, and you look very, very close to the ground, this beautiful, very short, very humble flower um, that in Hebrew is called Netzchalav. This one, Netz Chalav, the, the, the hawk of the milk or the milk of the hawk. Um, and it's white, but for the Christian believer, it looks like a star. And also, Chinanit Habata, okay, the, the graceful uh, flower of the field is a yellow star. Well, if you want it white, if you want it yellow. And then, Jesus is born in the New Testament. Uh, doesn't give us a lot about his childhood. He, the family escapes to Egypt, come back. There is an incident when he's 12 years old. And then when he's around 30, he begins his ministry around the Kinneret Lake. And most of his audience are people who live around the Kinneret Lake, who live in the Galilee. And many, many of them, including many of his 12 disciples, are fishermen. Um, so we have a boat and a boat. Uh, appears a few times in the stories of the New Testament. It is uh, um, 
successful and not successful fishing. It's calming the storm. It's calming the waves. It's using the the um, um, boat as a stage to talk to a crowd that is on the beach because he doesn't have distance enough to talk to a lot of people. And here we have the ancient boat that was found in Genosal in the 1980s when the level of the water uh, went down and two members of Kibbutz Genosal found this uh, about 2000 year old uh, boat. And it turns out that the majority of the boat is built out of two trees, the cedar and the oak. These are the two trees that are the mightiest. They are the tallest or the strongest or the most impressive. And it's really uh, natural that these two quality trees would provide the wood for something that has to last for decades. And it's an expensive thing about. It goes through the family generation after generation. Um, so most of the outside was built out of cedar. Most of the ribs inside were built out of oak, but since this boat did serve for a few decades and it was broken more than a few times and it was always fixed. Um, when they fix it, they didn't have the money perhaps um, for these very expensive trees. And there are 12 different other species that uh, were recognized by archaeologists uh, um, researching uh, what this boat is made of. And one of these times when Jesus comes back from fishing and there's a multitude of people waiting for him on the shore. There are 5,000 people waiting to hear his teachings, to, work, to listen to his words, and they all have to be fed. And what you have is loaves, five small loaves and two small fish, but it's not just loaves. If we would just said loaves, you, you would think it was wheat because that is the automatic. Most of our bread for human consumption is made out of wheat, but here it is said specifically that it's barley. Barley is the most inferior, I think, my impression of the seven species. It is not one of the top three of the, the, the grain, um, the chita, the dagan, uh, the itzal, the olive oil, or the tirosh, the grape. Um, it is not as tasty as a fig um, or as a pomegranate. Um, it's sort of the side sister of the wheat. It, this is the food of the poor, the food of the meek, sometimes the food of the animals. Um, and I think it is very symbolic that this is what the crowd eats a minute before Jesus goes up to the mountain and gives the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon of Beatitudes, the sermon where he blesses the people. Who does he bless? Blessed are the poor, those who have to eat bread made out of barley. After three years of ministry, we, become, we get close to the main story of the book, the journey to Jerusalem and the last week in Jesus' life. And because he is in the Galilee, he has to get to Jerusalem. He takes sort of road 90 all the way to Jericho and makes it right. He does not go through Samaria. Very similar to today, you, Jews avoided Samaria on the way from the Galilee to Jerusalem to avoid the Samaritans. And as he reaches Jericho, he enters the city and there was a man there named Zacchaeus, and he was the chief tax collector. Uh, like today, 2000 years ago, tax collector, in, in the eyes of the crowd, he is the bad person. He is the government that takes the money. And um, this person was short. And if you would like to go through the crowd to get to the first line to see Jesus from the first line, the people wouldn't let him. They didn't like him. Therefore, he had to climb on the sycamore, on the shikma tree to see Jesus. Now, between me and you, sycamores don't really grow in Jericho. It is not their area. Sycamores, as we know, um, and I'll show you uh, in, uh, immediately the quotes, 
in the Shvela, in the lowlands, in the southern part of the coastal plain in Israel, or in the lower Galilee. Um, so why did the New Testament did not say just a tree? Why did it not take a tree that you would find in Jericho, like a palm tree? You know that uh, uh, Jericho is Ir HaTmarim, the palm city. Specifically because whoever wrote that chapter knows his Hebrew. And sycamore in Hebrew is shikma, which comes from the root of shikum, which is something we're talking about a lot today, rehabilitation. This tree is a survivor tree. You can cut it to the ground and it will grow again. If you cut um, a brush, um, a cypress tree or a pine to the ground, that's it. You beheaded them and they won't grow again. But a sycamore tree from the stump, new branches that are very good for building that will be used again will grow. Also, it's a survivor tree. It lives in a sandy area. The winds can either bring sand or take away sand. It can bring so much sand that it covers half the tree. Other trees would rot, the, sh the shikma survives. It could take so much sand that the roots can be exposed. Other trees would dry out, the shikma survives. So this specific choice of shikma of rehabilitation, of repentance, of being born again and being born again better and newer. This is why this was chosen because Zacchaeus, after going up on the tree and meeting Jesus, became a follower and became a much, much better person. So um, I'm showing you the quotes telling you where the shikma should be growing naturally uh, in the Western foothills. That is the area where King David actually had a person in charge. And um, in the area of Judea where prophet Amos lived and in the lower Galilee, wherever the lower Galilee is, that's where sycamore trees are, upper Galilee, it's too cold for this tropical tree to grow. And then going up the mountain from the area of the Dead Sea, going up 1,200 meters. Finally, he reaches Jerusalem from the east. Now, many, many pilgrims and tourists who come to Israel just say the name Beit Pag Bethany, not realizing that it should be in English. Beit Pag, the house of the unripe fig, like the green one over here. And Bethany is Beit Te'ena, the house of the ripe fig, like the purple one over here. Two different villages east of Jerusalem, um, on the, the peak and on the eastern slope of Mount of Olives. And this is the area that Jesus begins his activity on that last week. He um, did not order in advance, so he did not have a hotel inside <laughs> the city of Jerusalem. So unfortunately, he and his disciples had to stay what is today an eastern neighborhood of Jerusalem. At that time, it was outside the walls. In the middle, there is um, gave, um, the, the Valley of the Kidron. So there is a climb down over here to the valley and then a climb up to Mount of Olives, which they had to do on a daily, on a daily basis. So Mount of Olives is named after its olive trees till today. Getshemani is the English pronunciation of Gatchmanim, the uh, olive press. But here we are talking about the figs, the ripe and unripe uh, figs. And so it's not surprising that when he reaches Bethpage and Bethany, he saw a fig tree. Now, this is a picture I took on one of, um, one of the courtyards of um, one of the churches of Mount of Olives. And you see here that a, a fig tree grew on the roots of an olive tree. I thought it was very, very 
um, interesting. Now remember, Jesus came as a Jewish pilgrim to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, Pesach. It is around April, the month of Nisan. It is spring. And in the springtime, the fig does not have fruit. We know it very well. We enjoy the fruit of the figs during July and August. We um, harvest, we orim the fruit day by day, every morning, whatever is ripe. Um, and he comes to a fig tree and he wants to see fruit and he doesn't. Now he knows very well, it is not the season. His listeners, his followers know very well that this is not the season. So what right does he have to be angry at the tree? Because at this point of Jesus' life, he is an expecting the unnatural. He is expecting things to happen against nature, more hasten than the nature, to get things uh, together. So he curses that fig tree. Why didn't you give me tree, uh, fruit? And the next day, that tree withers. Um, and th this is a prophecy that came true within a day. For the Christian believer, every fig tree is, is, and every time you see the withered leaves next to a fig tree, that is a what yet again another proof of um, of Jesus being a prophet. The next step is Jesus entering the old city, the, the, the walled city of Jerusalem. But before we go there, let's go back, let's twirl back in time um, to when he was born. And as I mentioned before, his family had to escape to Egypt. As we know, on the way to the Nile, you have to pass through the Negev and the Sinai Desert. And there's another bit of desert in Egypt until you get to the Nile itself. So they move from one oasis to another, from one source of water to another. In many of these oases, you will have palm trees. And in one of these stops on the way, while they are resting under a palm tree, and you can imagine Mary uh, leaning her back on the trunk of a palm, looking up to the sky, baby Jesus in her arm, he is, was just born. He can't really speak if it was a uh, regular baby. And she looks at the fruit and she would like to have some. And Joseph tells her, we cannot ask for the fruit. The tree is too tall. It's too high. I cannot get to it. And then the child Jesus, uh, with a joyful face, uh, in the bosom of his mother, says to the palm or tree, Bend your branches and refresh my mother with thy fruit. And it happens. The tree bends. All of this is not written in the New Testament, but um, pseudo Matthew. This is a, a later book, like we have later books in the um, in the um, our Bible as well. Um, and the palm bends and allows them to have fruit. And it waits bended until Jesus commands it to straighten up again. And also a spring of water begins just at the roots of the palm tree. And Jesus is very, very grateful for this palm tree, for giving them shade and nourishment and water, saving their lives in their journey to Egypt. And he remembered that favor for 33 years. So now we go back to our timeline and we are entering Jerusalem um, and we are entering with palm branches, with the palm of victory. And okay? this is the, the thanks that Jesus gave to the palms in this unknown story by making it very, very famous by something that people are reenacting every year in the week of Easter, Easter Sunday, going into the city, uh, holding these palm branches. A week is spent in Jerusalem. This was Sunday. We are now already on Thursday. Many miracles and events happened. 
and we reach the Passover meal, which happens to be the Last Supper. And as a Jew in a festive meal, he will bless the bread and the wine. Motzi and Bore But Jesus adds a little twist. And when he takes the bread, he says, take and eat this, this is my body. And when he takes the cup, he adds, drink from it, all of you, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of their sins. So the grape, the grape juice, the wine, is the blood of Jesus, is Jesus. In many, many ancient Byzantine time churches, we will see engravings in the rocks or mosaic floors with clusters of grapes, with bunches of grapes, with grape leaves, because it's aesthetic, because it's a nice thing, because it's from the seven species, because it's something from the land. You will see it also in ancient uh, synagogues, but in synagogues, it means seven species. In churches, it means Jesus. And it is very, very fitting and symbolic that the decorations in the Last Supper room are grapes and grape leaves. Okay? This is the correct decoration for the event that happened in this room specifically. I see that the time is chasing up on us. Mo, could you please tell me if you would like me to continue or continue in two weeks? Because there are many more slides to go. It not depends on me. What you all want. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, thank you, everyone. So whoever stays and listens, I am very grateful. The last supper ends. They go back to Gethsemane. He um, is kissed by Judas and given to the Romans. Jesus stands on trial. Um, and then he is given the cross and he has to walk through the way of the cross, the way of agony, of misery, the Via Dolorosa. And those who travel through Jerusalem today know that station number six is dedicated to Veronica. Veronica, who was a very, very sick woman, and she saw Jesus going back and uh, going by sweating. She gave him her handkerchief to wipe his face, his true icon, his vera icon, his true face was imprinted on the handkerchief. He gave it back to her and she heals. So a flower is dedicated to Veronica. This uh, Veronica Syria. Now there's an interesting story about this because when Zionists began returning to the land of Israel and among them were also botanists and first botany books in Hebrew were being uh, written. And of course, store, uh, plants and uh, flowers and, and trees from the Tanakh found their name again. Uh, and it was no problem giving a name in Hebrew. And then there's this plant that was given a very, very Christian name. So the Zionist botanist looked at it and said, look, but it has Zionist colors. It is blue and white. So they changed the V to B. So it's not Vera icon anymore. It's a word that has no meaning, Veronica with a Dagesh in the bet, and they called it Zionist. It's not Christian anymore. And here we showed you, sort of like uh, what Ellen did two days ago with Wikipedia. Okay. And finally, uh, Jesus reaches the point uh, where he's going to be crucified and the Roman soldiers to mock him, uh, crown him with a crown of thorns. Now this is something very Roman. 
because a Jewish king does not really have a crown. A Jewish king is anointed with olive oil. He is a Mashiach. A crown is something that you would see on a king, on an emperor. Um, so we know that thorns and thistles were already um, mentioned in Genesis um, when the first sin, um, when Adam and Eve were thrown away from the Garden of Eden. So, and since the sacrifice of Jesus was to cleanse the universe, cleanse humanity from that initial sin, and from this point and on, whoever believes in him. So we see again, uh, the crown of thorns comes to close that cycle. Um, and what thorn is it? Um, it is very, very possible that we're talking about the Shezef. In Latin, Sisyphus Spina Christi, the, the thorn of Jesus. Now, uh, if you look at it really, really carefully, you see that from each bend of the branch, from each uh, um, fracture, two spikes come out, not only one. One is hooked and the other one is straight in another direction. I hope you can see this, okay? Now, sometimes thorny plants, all the thorns go in the same direction. So if you touch it in a certain angle, it's okay. But in the case of the Shizaf, there's no angle you can approach it. It will hurt you wherever you move and from which direction and from which angle. These, by the way, are the fruits and they taste like a tasteless apple. If you have absolutely no other choice and nothing else to eat, you are most welcome to eat. These are not poisonous, uh, but they will satisfy you as a tasteless apple. Um, and also the 90% uh, of the fruit is a stone, the pit inside. So there's not much uh, uh, flesh in it. So in the translation to the local um, languages, Hebrew took only the phonetics. From the word Sisyphus, we took the Shezaf. The Arabic took a deeper meaning, sort of like the Maramiya, the Marva, the sage that I showed you before, okay? Domim is the Arab mispronunciation of Domini, which means the Lord, which means Jesus, the tree of Jesus. Okay. On the cross itself, Jesus is uh, handed vinegar and he is handed the vinegar it's too high up it's on a stick on a bunch of azul on a stalk of hyssop plant now joanna spoke about this yesterday those of us who followed us um and i agree with you joanna malva um would be a better uh, a better plan for this the hyssop has an ability to absorb liquids at least a bit. And again, the whoever wrote this in the New Testament chose the hyssop, chose the azov purposely. Although there are other plants who absorb more liquids because he remembers the story of Passover. He remembers the story of the, the blood of the sacrifice, um, that the people of Israel sacrifice so God will pass over the houses and not have the 10th plague. Now, whoever reads that, if he knows enough of his Judaism, and of course the first readers of these stories were all Jews, they made the connection, made the connection between the sacrifice of Passover and the sacrifice of Jesus through the plant, through the hyssop, through its ability to absorb the liquid, whether it's blood, or vinegar. The cross itself, we're not sure from what plant it is. This actually is not mentioned. So there are many, many, many theories about this. Was it cedar? Was it pine? Was it cypress? 
So I here took pictures, um, not in Neot Numim in this case, this, as you can well see, is on Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Um, this is in a JNF forest, not far away from my house, but you can see how impressive this tree is amongst the others in the forest. Um, and this is a very famous brosh of uh, Sedra um, in the lower Galilee. And you can see by the number of people below it, how big the tree is. So the, the cross was made out of a big, impressive tree. Um, in the uh, monastery of the cross um, in Jerusalem, not far from the Knesset and the Israel Museum, there is a uh, picture, a mural of a big tree that has three trunks, one of a cedar, one of a pine, one of a cypress, a miraculous tree that was actually combined out of these three. But once again, we are not sure what tree was the real cross. And we know that in hundreds, if not more, churches around the world today, uh, there are allegedly fractions of the Veracruz, the true cross. So from this point on, from the moment that Jesus was uh, um, crucified, anything that has the shape of a cross becomes very symbolic to a Christian believer. So this is one famous, one of many examples. So this is the, the Maltese cross. Uh, we know it in Hebrew as um, um, These pictures were taken at Korazin at the springtime. Oh, and I'm glad we reached here and I still have my audience because this is, um, this is the best thing. After he was crucified and buried, the whole point is that he resurrected. Without that last chapter of resurrecting, Everything that we said till now does not have a meaning. The resurrection means that he is the chosen, that he is the son of God. And there are some plants, not only one, um, in different deserts in the world, not only in Israel, you can find plants with the same quality also in Texas, um, that seem to be dead during times of, of uh, dryness. And even if it takes five years or 10 years between one rainfall and the other, they will survive in this demi-dead situation. And then as you wet it, as the rain comes, they will come to life again. So this is called the Rose of Jericho, Shoshana um, Tericho. In, in souvenir shops around the world, they, send, they sell you all kinds, including some that came from New Mexico and Texas. This is the real one, the real rose of Jericho. And I took one that seemed to be dry and I put it in the bowl of water. And within 10 minutes, it came back to life. So this is what it looked like after 10 minutes. Let me remind you, this is what it started from. And I think this is a very uh, good ending to a presentation at this point. Um, reviving, resurrecting, going back to life, flourishing again. These are things that uh, we all hope for in the times that we are going through now. Thank you. I'm only 10 minutes late. Um, <laughs> I will Rona, can you hear me? Yes. This is Joyce. Amazing. Glad to know. And, and our tour to be with you right Fantastic. now. So thank you so much for this. And we really are missing out by not being there with you. Okay, let me let me tell the crowd here. Okay. <laughs> you were supposed to land three days ago in Israel. That's correct. Yes. With your group. And I was supposed to be guiding you till today. That's right. <laughs> Four days. So I'm really glad you joined me today. You remind us where you're joining us from. I'm I'm in Chicago, but our group Chicago. was from all over the world. Yeah. What time is it in Chicago now? Eight o'clock in the morning, a little after. Thank you so much for getting up so early for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. 
you're most welcome. And please, Joyce and all the others, okay? Um, though my presentation was with a Christian focus and most of the other presentations are a lot more Jewish, please join us every day at eight o'clock. If you have the time, there are wonderful other lectures. So you're most welcome. I will certainly try. This has been very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let me see if there are any questions. Um, but it will spread seed, next generation. Okay, thank you very much, Leah, for that. Yes, it is dead and it's spreading its, its seed. So that also is a, is a hopeful message. Okay, anyone else questions, remarks? So since we're already 50% off our time, I will see you again next Wednesday. And once again, remember there's a presentation every day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely.